Hello, STAT 200. Welcome to Lesson 6, Hypothesis Testing Part 2. This lesson covers content from Sections 4.4 and 4.5 of the LOC 5 textbook. This is going to be one of the shorter lecture videos because there are no new procedures this week. This lesson is primarily conceptual. It builds on what you learned about hypothesis testing in Lesson 5 and confidence intervals in Lesson 4 so you may want to go back to review those lessons before starting this one. I'll start with a very brief review of hypothesis testing. If you're watching this video on YouTube, in the description of the video, there's a table of contents that you can use to jump ahead if you feel like you don't need this review. Last week, we learned that we use a five-step hypothesis testing procedure to conduct a hypothesis test using randomization methods. Step one, is to determine what type of test you need to conduct and write the hypotheses. These are the parameters that we're working with right now, so you should start by determining which of these parameters you're testing. Then you use that parameter to write your hypotheses. In addition to knowing the parameter, you also need to know the direction, so if it's left-tailed, right-tailed, or two-tailed. For a single sample mean or single sample proportion, you'll need to know the hypothesized parameter. That's the number that goes in the hypotheses. Here are some examples of what your hypotheses could look like. Step two is to construct a randomization distribution given that the null hypothesis is true. This is where you'll go to stack key and input your sample data. If you're doing a test for a single mean or single proportion, you'll also need to enter in the number from the hypotheses. Then you'll take at least 5,000 resamples to build your randomization distribution. This is the sampling distribution that you'll use in the next step. Step three is to use the randomization distribution to find the p-value. The p-value is the area of your randomization distribution that is more extreme than the observed sample statistic in the direction of the alternative hypothesis. Step four is to decide if you should reject or fail to reject the null hypothesis. To do this, we compare our p-value to the alpha level that we're using for the test. This week we'll learn more about choosing an alpha level, but unless otherwise specified, assume that the alpha level is 0.05. If the p-value is greater than 0.05, fail to reject the null hypothesis. If the p-value is less than or equal to 0.05, reject the null hypothesis. And finally, step five, state a real-world conclusion in relation to the original research question. If you need more of a review on hypothesis testing, I recommend going back to lesson five in the online notes to watch some of the video examples because Lesson 6 assumes that you have a good understanding of everything from Lesson 5. These are the learning objectives that we're going to be covering in Lesson 6. There are no new procedures this week. This is more of a conceptual lesson where you'll dig into hypothesis testing and at the end, confidence intervals as well, more deeply. Let's start with identifying Type 1 and Type 2 errors. When we talk about Type 1 and Type 2 errors, we usually make a table that looks something like this, where on one side we have our decision, and on the other side we have reality. So in the population, whether or not the null hypothesis is really true. Make sure you pay attention to how the rows and columns are labeled. Here's the table from your textbook, and you can see that here they put the decision in the columns, and reality in the rows. So sometimes you'll see these going in different directions. If you Google type one and type two error, you'll find a bunch of other tables as well, and some of them will flip the order of the rows or the order of the columns as well. So you always need to pay attention to the labels to make sure that you're interpreting the table correctly. Looking at either of these tables, a type one error occurs when we reject the null hypothesis, when the null hypothesis is really true. In other words, we conclude that there was a difference in the population 
but in reality, there's no difference in the population. This is also known as an alpha error. A type 2 error, then, is when we fail to reject the null hypothesis, when in reality, the null hypothesis is false. So we conclude that there's not evidence of a difference in the population, when really there is a difference in the population. This is also known as a beta error. Now in real life, you're usually not going to know what the population values are. If we had the population values at the beginning, then we wouldn't need to conduct a hypothesis test. Sometimes you'll learn these values after the fact, though. For example, if you get access to the population data later. But most of the time, we won't know for sure if we've committed a type 1 or type 2 error. Let's look at a few examples of identifying these different types of errors. Here's our research question. Are more than half of the residents of one town women? In a sample of 30 residents, 17 were women. We can use our research question to write our hypotheses. We have a sample from one town, and we want to know if the population proportion is greater than half, or 0 0.5. Next, we use StatKey to construct our randomization distribution. This is using the sample data where the counts of successes were 17 and the total sample size was 30. I use the default setting for hypothesized population proportion of 0 0.5. The p-value is the area on this randomization distribution that was greater than the observed sample statistic, which was 17 out of 30, or 0 0.5. Six, seven. Because our p-value is greater than the standard 0 0.05 alpha level, we fail to reject the null hypothesis. There is not evidence that more than half of all residents in this town are women. What if we later obtain census data? A census collects data from everyone, in other words, the population. And what if a census found that 53% of residents are women? Well, in that case, our earlier conclusion was incorrect. We said that there was not evidence that the population proportion was greater than 0 0.5, but in reality it is. We made an error. Looking at our table, our decision was to fail to reject the null hypothesis. In reality, the null hypothesis was really false, and the alternative hypothesis was really true. It looks like we made a type 2 error. I'll go through two more quicker examples. A hypothesis test was conducted given the following hypotheses. The null is that the mean of group 1 equals the mean of group 2. The alternative is that the mean of group 1 does not equal the mean of group 2. With a p-value of 0 0.045, the researchers rejected the null hypothesis, but in reality, the two groups' means are equal. In this scenario, they rejected the null hypothesis. In reality, the two groups' means are equal, so in reality, the null hypothesis is true. They made a type 1 error. And here's our last example. A hypothesis test was conducted given the following hypotheses. The null is that rho, which is the population correlation, equals 0, and the alternative is that rho does not equal 0. With a p-value of 0 0.002, the researchers rejected the null hypothesis. In reality, rho equals 0 0.328. It means in reality, the null hypothesis is false. They made a correct decision. Moving on to our second learning objective, select an appropriate significance level, in other words, alpha level, for a given scenario. 
Last week, we learned that unless otherwise stated, we use an alpha level of 0 0.05. Your textbook defines the significance level, alpha, as representing the tolerable probability of making a type 1 error. Remember that a type 1 error is rejecting the null hypothesis when the null hypothesis is true. So we're saying that if the null hypothesis is true, this alpha level is the proportion of our test for which we would reject the null and make a type 1 error. When we're conducting a hypothesis test, the alpha level is the highest p-value for which we would reject the null. This is a cutoff that should be set before you collect any data and conduct the hypothesis test. By default, this is usually set at 0 0.05, which means that if the null hypothesis is true, we would still reject 5% of the time committing a type 1 error. Depending on the consequences of making each type of error, sometimes we like to use a smaller or larger alpha level. If the consequences of making a type 1 error are severe, then we use a smaller alpha level. For example, in some medical research where making a type 1 error could mean giving people ineffective treatment, the alpha levels are sometimes set at 0 0.01 or even 0 0.001. If the consequences of making a type 2 error are severe, then we usually use a larger alpha level usually 0 0.10. You see a higher alpha level in a lot of pilot studies, which are smaller studies that are done earlier when researchers are planning a larger study. Pilot studies are used to inform research study design and to get preliminary data, but they're not usually used to make decisions, so the consequences of a type 1 error are very low stakes. Our third learning objective is to explain the problems associated with conducting multiple tests. The procedures that we've learned so far have been for a single group or for the difference in two groups. What if we wanted to compare three or more groups? Let's say that we wanted to compare three groups, A, B, and C. Using what we've learned so far, we could compare A to B, then A to C, and finally B to C. But there are a few problems with this. First, it's not really addressing the research question of how all three groups are different. So we wouldn't be able to make an overall conclusion about differences. We would just be able to make claims about pairwise differences. Second, and probably the most important, is that if we use an alpha level of 0.05 for each of these tests, the alpha level overall would be greater than 0.05. The alpha levels for the three tests are not quite additive, but here the overall alpha level for these three tests together would be closer to 0.15. The more tests you do, the higher that overall alpha level gets. That is a real problem because it's increasing how likely it is that you're committing type 1 errors. Later in the course, we'll learn about some tests that may be used instead of performing multiple tests. For example, to compare the means of three or more groups, you can use an analysis of variance. To compare the proportions in three or more groups, you can use a chi-square goodness of fit test. Or, one quick correction is to use the Bonferrani method. This takes your overall alpha level and divides it by the number of tests that you're conducting. For example, if we're conducting three tests with a 0.05 alpha level, we would take that alpha level and divide it by three tests. Instead of comparing each p-value to 0.05, we would compare each p-value to 0.0167. The Bonferrani method tends to be overly conservative, which means that it's more difficult to reject the null hypothesis. So you're less likely to make a type 1 error. But since it's more difficult to reject the null, you're also more likely to make a type 2 error. When we get to the analysis of variance lesson later in the course, we'll talk about the Tukey method and we'll talk more then about why that method is often preferred. What's most important now is that you understand that you shouldn't just do multiple pairwise comparisons 
without doing some correction to take into account the number of tests that you're conducting. A related issue is publication bias. Publication bias occurs when only statistically significant results are published. And this is because statistically significant results are usually regarded as being more interesting. It's a problem because with the standard 0.05 alpha level, if there's no difference in the population, 5% of studies could still yield statistically significant results due to type 1 errors. Here's a visual to help with that. Let's say that 100 researchers are each testing these hypotheses. Below, we have 100 dots to represent these 100 independent tests. And in the population, the null hypothesis is true. So in reality, the two means are equal. If each researcher uses a 0.05 alpha level, we would expect about 5% of these tests to be statistically significant just due to random sampling variations. Because research studies with statistically significant results are more likely to be published than studies that find no significant differences, when we go to read journal articles, we will probably only find the five studies that had statistically significant results. The 95 that were not significant would have had a more difficult time getting published. And as consumers of research, we don't have a way of knowing that those 95 studies were ever conducted. Unfortunately, this is a current problem with scientific research. Our fourth learning objective is to interpret the results of a hypothesis test in terms of practical significance. Practical significance refers to the magnitude of the difference. Results are practically significant when the difference is large enough to be meaningful in real life. There are different ways to quantify practical significance using what we call measures of effect size. For example, for the difference in two means, you can use Cohen's D. This is equal to the differences in the two groups means divided by the pooled standard deviation. The formula for the pooled standard deviation is here, and we'll learn more about this in Lesson 9, but it's essentially a weighted average of the standard deviations of the two groups. Cohen's D is the difference between the two groups in standard deviation units. For a single mean, you could compute D as the difference between the observed sample mean and the hypothesized mean in standard deviation units. From the online notes, these are the general rules for interpreting D. If it is between 0 and 0 0.2, there's little or no effect. 0 0.2 to 0 0.5, a small effect size. 0 0.5 to 0 0.8, a medium effect size. And anything larger than 0 0.8 is a large effect size. Let's look at a quick example of computing Cohen's D. Here we have data from two groups. We have the sample means, sample standard deviations, and sample sizes. Since we have two groups, we're going to use the first formula here. We start by computing the pooled standard deviation by plugging in the values for the standard deviations and the sample sizes. When we work through all of the algebra, we get the pooled standard deviation of 4.533. The pooled standard deviation should always be somewhere in between the standard deviations of the two groups because it's a way of averaging the two groups. Now we solve for D. This is the difference in the two sample means divided by the pooled standard deviation. Here, Cohen's D is 0.441, which is a small effect size. This means that the difference in the two groups means is 0.441 standard deviation units. Whether or not this is practically significant would really depend on the scenario. That was an example for the difference in two means. The formula for one sample mean is similar. For proportions, you can just look at the difference and judge whether it's meaningful given the scenario that you're working with. For correlations and regression, you can compute R squared, that's just Pearson's R 
squared. It represents the proportion of variance that is shared between the two variables, but we'll learn more about that in Lesson 12 when we devote an entire week to correlation and simple linear regression. What's most important here is that you can distinguish between practical and statistical significance, which is actually our fifth learning objective. Practical and statistical significance address two different questions. Practical significant asks, is there a meaningful difference? In other words, is the observed difference large enough that it matters in the real world? Statistical significance asks, is there a difference in the population? Practical significance can be quantified using a measure of effect size, such as Cohen's D or R squared, or you can just look at the difference in the sample. Statistical significance is determined by the p-value. Practical significance can be subjective. Researchers don't always agree on what is meaningful in the real world. For example, in a weight loss study, one person could say that a mean weight loss of 5 pounds is enough to be meaningful, while someone else could say that it needs to be at least 10 pounds to be meaningful. Statistical significance is more objective. Because we set the alpha level before we collect the data and conduct the study, if the p-value is less than or equal to the alpha level, then the results are statistically significant. There is some subjectivity in setting the alpha level, but actually making the decision is very cut and dry. Either the p-value is greater than alpha or it's less than or equal to alpha. Either we fail to reject or we reject. Our sixth learning objective is to explain how changing different aspects of a research study will change the statistical power of the tests conducted. Power is the probability of rejecting the null hypothesis given that the null hypothesis is false. In other words, if there is really a difference in the population, the probability that you'll be able to reject the null hypothesis. If we look back at our table from earlier, power falls where we reject the null hypothesis, when the null hypothesis is really false. This is sometimes written as one minus beta. Power can be increased in a few different ways. The most straightforward is usually to just increase the sample size. In the last two lessons, we saw how the sample size influences the standard error. When we have a larger sample size, we have a tighter sampling distribution, which gives us a smaller p-value. Thus, we're more likely to reject the null hypothesis. If you're testing for a mean or the difference in means, decreasing the sample standard deviation will increase power. This is because this will also decrease the standard error, making the sampling distribution narrower. The third possibility is to increase the effect size. In other words, look at the alternative hypothesis and make that difference as large as possible. This won't change the sampling distribution, but it will change the cutoff at the bottom. It will move that cutoff out more in the direction of the alternative hypothesis to make the area that is the p-value smaller. And the last possibility, which is usually discouraged, is to use a larger alpha level. A larger alpha level means that the p-value doesn't need to be as small to be rejected. This makes it more likely to reject the null hypothesis, but it also makes it more likely to commit a type 1 error, which is why this is usually not recommended. That brings us to our last learning objective. Compare and contrast confidence intervals and hypothesis tests. Here we're bringing together what we learned in lessons four and five. Both confidence intervals and hypothesis tests are inferential procedures. This means that they use data from a sample to make an inference about the larger population. They differ in how they approach that though. A confidence interval estimates a population parameter. Here, you have no idea what the population parameter may be, so you're using the information that you have from your sample to estimate it. A hypothesis test tests a specific parameter. If you have a hypothesized population parameter, you use hypothesis testing methods. 
For both confidence intervals and hypothesis tests, the sampling distribution is constructed via resampling procedures. This means that we have data from a sample and we repeatedly take random samples to construct the sampling distribution. For confidence intervals, we use bootstrapping techniques. For hypothesis testing, we use randomization techniques. The difference between these is that with the randomization techniques, we have a specific null hypothesis that we're testing. So with randomization, the sampling distribution will be centered on the null parameter. With bootstrapping, the sampling distribution will be centered on the observed sample statistic. Something to note is that a 95% confidence interval is approximately equivalent to a two-tailed hypothesis test with a 0.05 alpha level. Here's an example of what that means. Using the body temperature data set in Statkey, I constructed a 95% confidence interval for the mean of 98.056 to 98.476. This means that any value between these two values is a reasonable estimate for the population mean. To demonstrate this, in StatKey, I conducted a two-tailed hypothesis test. First, using the default null hypothesis that mu equals 98.6. Because 98.6 falls outside of the 95% confidence interval, I expect to reject the null hypothesis because this is not a reasonable value for the population mean. And that was the case. The p-value testing these hypotheses was 0 0.00040. So the null hypothesis was rejected. There was evidence that the population mean was different from 98.6. Next, I changed the hypothesized parameter to 98.1. 98.1 does fall within the 95% confidence interval. Because this value is within the confidence interval, it is a reasonable estimate of the population mean. Therefore, I expect to fail to reject the null. And that is what happened. The p-value testing these hypotheses was 0 0.148, so the null hypothesis was not rejected. That concludes our Lesson 6 lecture. If you have any questions, please post them to the Lesson 6 discussion board in Canvas.